जिसका महला ही में जले चंद लोगों की खुशियों को लेकर चले I've been singing these revolutionary songs now for the better part of 10 years. And whenever I'm invited to a television program or I'm being interviewed by a newspaper, they always ask me one specific question without fail. Can music really transform society? Can music really bring about a revolution? Can art really result in social transformation? Obviously when people ask this question, the first thought that comes to my mind is Perhaps these people don't know about the Italian Renaissance and the influence it had on world history, on European history, and how it ushered in a new period, reformation of enlightenment and of modernity. So what was the Renaissance? Well, what we know about it to begin with is that it begins in the 14th century and it lasts all the way to, well, we could say till the 17th century, really. The Renaissance is a period of enormous cultural rebirth, extraordinary creativity. It provides really a bridge between the medieval period and the period that historians like to refer to as modernity. It ended the period that we often refer to as the Dark Ages and really laid the foundation for modern Europe. It began by a renewed interest in the classics of the Greco-Roman period. What were the humanist works of Greco-Roman civilization, that is Greece and Rome? And the central idea there was that if during the medieval period too much attention had been paid to the divine, to the sacred, now with the Renaissance, human attention, the subject of our scholarship would not be the divine and the sacred, the life hereafter but would be human beings. Human beings would be at the center of our thinking about the world. It would no longer be God. Now this is a pretty revolutionary radical idea, especially for the time, but perhaps even for the times that we live in, in Pakistan today. So you can see that Weary's medieval period was extraordinarily concerned with the sacred. The Renaissance was now concerned with the secular, with the world in which we live, the material world. And this idea, which we refer to as humanism, putting humans at the center of our scholarship, understanding, thinking, philosophy, was first reflected in Italy in the arts. The arts were in Italy what social media is today in our world. In other words, new ideas could be communicated with incredible rapidity at the mass level only through art. Because remember, this is the period before the invention of the printing press. This is the period before the invention of ma or, or the creation of mass literacy. So how do you convey complex ideas to the general population? You convey them through magnificent, enormous works of art, architecture and music. Florence and Venice were perhaps some of the earliest cities to abandon medieval feudalism. They created a new plutocracy, we can call it a plutocracy because it was based largely on this new sort of wealth, the wealth that you have when you have coin through commerce. And the new families that came up through commerce, through trade, um, that had wealth not held in terms of land but had wealth in terms of coin, these trading families began to patronize a new kind of art, a new kind of science and a new kind of philosophy. And gradually through the 15th century, their ideas spread throughout Europe and caused an enormous change um, across Europe, across um, different generations of people, different people living in all different parts of Europe. And really it was an intellectual revolution. So really the Renaissance was an enormous revolution. At its heart was a new kind of understanding of creativity. It led to changes in politics, society, economics and culture. It led to the creation of an entirely new worldview, a worldview in which humanity was always striving towards progress. It led towards new attitude towards culture and learning. And of course, it led to the idea of individual achievement. The Renaissance man was supposed to be the master of everything. No longer were people sort of, you know, purely looking only at one field of knowledge in fact, they were trying to become masters of everything. And they began to believe fundamentally that one could master 
several, if not all, the different fields of human knowledge. So the Renaissance man or the Renaissance woman would be a person who would be an artist, who would be a theoretician, a philosopher, a musician, a historian, a man of letters, even someone who would be a traveler, a sports person. The spirit of adventure was very much central to the idea of the Renaissance. For example, Christopher Columbus in 1492, Copernicus in 1530, all of these people had a sense that they were breaking boundaries, whether geographic boundaries or intellectual boundaries, and trying to understand the world in a very different way. So what led to the Renaissance and why did it occur in Italy? Why not in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh or some other part of the world? I think it has to do with the peculiar structure of the Italian city-states. First and foremost, the Italian city-states were such that the old landed class which dominated pretty much all over Europe and also dominated, as I think you realize, pretty much all over the world, was broken in the city-states of uh, Italy. Here, the trading and merchant class first came to dominance over society. And this, I think, is one of the fundamental key elements that began to change how it Italian politics and intellectual life really functioned. You must have heard of the Medici family, but there were several other families that came to dominate over the city-states of Italy. So the very structure of these Italian city-states also transformed. And let's remember that these were small uh, states. So unlike the massive states of Asia, you know, the massive states of Persia or the Ottoman Empire, these were states that were essentially limited only to their cities. And I think this, uh, you know, and all the cities were at many times at war with each other. But the fact that there wasn't a very massive, you know, land-based state in Italy played a very important role in the emergence of the Renaissance. Then the third major factor was the Black Death. Because the Black Death resulted in a massive decline in the population. Some demographers say that at least a third of European uh, humanity was wiped out as a result of the Black Death. Now, as population declined, people who had skills, people who were, you know, skilled with a pen or skilled with a brush or skilled with a hammer or whatever skills they had, came to be very highly regarded. And after the Black Death, people with skills were had enormous freedom to do the things that they wanted to do because their skills were so highly in demand. They were so high in demand that the limitations that were placed upon them in an earlier epoch were entirely lifted. Then the fourth and one of the very important features was the discovery of Greek literature. And this happened, I think, much by coincidence. And that was that um, as the uh, Byzantine Empire was conquered by the Muslims, by the Ottomans, uh, many, many of the great scholars of the Byzantine Empire who studied Greek literature and Greek humanist uh, poetry uh, and plays, etc., fled from Constantinople and w came to Italy where they thought that there would be, uh, you know, freedom for them to continue to pursue their scholarly uh, thinking and work and research etc. So suddenly after the Ottoman conquest of uh, the Byzantine Empire Italy suddenly found itself full of scholars that had that had uh, that brought with them uh, the literature of ancient Greek Greece they, they could study and understand this literature and they began to teach it to other people so Italians began to discover not just uh, Greek literature but through these people they began to also discover Roman literature and of course this very much connected to the Italian past if you don't know uh, Roman civilization was really built in a certain way on the sh shoulders of Greek civilization and so Greek and Roman culture have a lot in common Greek and Roman philosophy have a lot in common so the discovery of Greek literature also meant a rediscovery of Roman literature and Italians in particular were very interested in rediscovering all of that because this was their past so this was part of their heritage so there was a almost you could say a, a fever to to study uh, Greek literature, to study Roman literature and to understand that past. And this fever, this new fashion or fad, whatever you want to call it, led uh, to people focusing less on uh, the ancient medieval texts of Christianity and much more on the ancient texts of the Greco-Roman civilizations of the past. 
um, of past history. So study of these arts led to new art movements that wanted to emulate the form and style of Greek and Roman art and that is essentially what led to the creation of what we call Renaissance arts. At first Renaissance art was not challenging or Renaissance thought itself was not in any way challenging the Roman Catholic Church. In fact quite the opposite. It was encouraged by the Roman and patronized by the Roman Catholic Church. But after a certain period of its own development uh, and transformation, it could not help, in my view, uh, but contradict the teachings of the church as they were understood at that particular point in time. So now we see new, incredible new Renaissance artists who have studied Greek and Roman works and are attempting to revive the classical form under the patronage of the church in the 14th century, developing various new techniques of doing art. For example, the technique of perspective or what, and 3D were developed as a consequence of the study of the ancient arts by Renaissance artists. Um, because it, it, I, and my wife and I actually have been to Italy, we've been to Rome and uh, Florence and other places in Italy and uh, discovered for ourselves in the Vatican and other places where you see Christian art and you see Renaissance art, the differences in technique, how during the Christian period everything was depicted in pretty much in two dimensions. There was no concept that if a person was further away that they would be smaller uh, uh, you know and therefore depicted as being smaller and also a lot of art was depicted from what's called the God's eye view where everything was viewed more or less equally because God sitting in on the seventh heaven would view things equidistant from that particular vantage point so the artist took that particular eye but now with the Renaissance art um, uh, you know the uh, uh, because we are talking about humans, but we're also talking about humans from the human point of view. Humans are at the center of everything and humans see everything through, the, through three dimensions. So Renaissance artists begin to more and more emphasize perspective and, um, and, and, and new and vibrant and very different colors. You can instantly tell Renaissance art from you know, the older medieval Christian art. Uh, although both are you know, sort of Christian art at this particular point in time, but you can see stylistically that they're incredibly quite different. So now this leads to the three great geniuses of Renaissance art. Leonardo da Vinci, who was born in 1452, passed away in 1519. Michelangelo, who was born in 1475 and passed away in 1564. And Raphael, born in 1483 and who passed away in 1520. These three artists together are considered as having transformed entirely the way in which art was uh, you know, done or performed in the medieval period and the way in which it was performed after uh, their influence, that is after the Renaissance. In addition to the art, there was an enormous transformation in the way in which now people began to study society, began to, began to study nature. And this transformation in what was being studied and how things were being studied is referred to as humanism. And it is the foundation really behind the academic discipline that we today call humanities. When you, um, when you opt to major in humanities, you are really opting to major in a subject that was created or rather recreated as a consequence of the Renaissance. So humanism is the pedagogical uh, and intellectual philosophical outcome of what or, or the correlate of what was an art movement but also was a philosophical transformation. So what is humanism? Humanism really is to literature was what the Renaissance was to the arts. It uh, invited us to focus much more on secular worldly affairs, on material affairs, on this world, on humanity rather than on religion, on the afterlife, on God, on the sacred. So the distinction between the two is don't focus on the, sac focus on the sacred, focus on the secular. Don't focus on the divine, focus on this world, etc. That was at the heart of, it, of humanism. The second major theme of humanism was the idea that we needed to stimulate individual creativity. That the individual was capable of far more than we give him 
or her credit for and that the individual could master several different disciplines. So you must have heard this expression, such and such person is a renaissance man or a renaissance woman. That means that they're incredibly creative, but not just in one field, in many, many different fields. The traditional university, uh, you know, used to teach theology, law and medicine. These were the sort of principal subjects taught uh, at that time. But when the, when the humanists came to dominate over universities and over education, and they were very, very influ influential on in education, they returned to Greek and Roman humanities. So they began to study, in addition to these things, grammar, rhetoric, poetry and history. And this had a huge and very lasting impact on education because the whole idea of what an education was supposed to equip a person with was transformed. It led to what we today refer to as, the, as a liberal arts understanding of education. So whenever people say, oh, I'm going to a liberal arts college, they're really going to a college which aspires to replicate the ideas of the Renaissance. One of the principal figures that's been credited with having begun the Renaissance is Francesco Petrarch, who was born in 1304 and passed away in 1374. He's an early humanist, a poet, and one of the great things that he did was that he, he assembled a library of Greek and Roman manuscripts, and that allowed um, people like Cicero, Homer, Virgil to be reread by Italians. It was through his library that Italians really began to rediscover all these great writers. And, and it is Petrarch who refers to the period from the 5th century till the Renaissance as the Dark Ages. Uh, he refers to the period in which the church dominated as the Dark Ages. So this is not something that, you know, this is not, this is not a particular epithet that, the, that Muslims gave, uh, you know, Christian rule, but rather it is uh, people from within Europe who refer to their own history or periods of their own history as the Dark Ages. A second great figure of the Renaissance is Desiderius Erasmus, who was born in 1466 and passed away in 1536. He was a Dutch priest and he's considered the crowning glory of Christian humanists. He wanted the Bible to be translated into all the local languages uh, of Europe, into the local vernacular. And in fact, this would have an enormous impact because at the time, the Bible was only read in Latin, but Latin was no longer a spoken language. So only a select few people who had studied with the church could understand the Bible and only they could interpret the Bible to ordinary people. This gave them enormous power over ordinary people because ordinary people had no access to the Bible. So they couldn't say, no, actually, you've misquoted the Bible or actually my understanding of this verse is different from your understanding or anything of that sort because they had no access to it. They only had access to it through the priests. And so that was the system through which priests were able to maintain their hegemony. But once the Bible was translated into all the other languages, ordinary working people, ordinary peasants could now also read the Bible and challenge the priest. That was very, very central to how uh, the dominance of the Catholic Church was undermined through the translation of the Bible into local languages. So Erasmus writes in his famous work, The Praise of Folly, which was published in 1509. And by this time, of course, the Gutenberg press has been invented. Gutenberg creates a press and a lot of the literature that you begin to see now, the humanist literature is being published through the press and is being disseminated at a mass level. So uh, one of those works, of course, is The Praise of Folly by Erasmus. In it, he writes, quote, happiness is reached when a person is ready to be what he is. You have heard this theme a bazillion times in movies and in songs, etc. You've even heard it earlier, you know, with, uh, with Socrates, you know, know thyself, etc. But here with re the Renaissance, this becomes one of the central themes of human emancipation, that a man or a person or a woman can emancipate themselves only by getting to know who they really are. Erasmus also used satire on the corruption and doctrinal wrangling of the church. He would lampoon them, you know, make fun of them, etc. And in his great work uh, on folly, which he considered a naive ignorance, he said, this is an essential part of being human. It brings happiness and contentment. So when he writes in praise of folly, in praise of naive ignorance, he is actually writing that it's okay to be a little ignorant sometimes uh, because you can actually be happy because knowledge, he says, 
can be a burden. It can lead to complications. It can lead to a troublesome life. Religion is also a form of folly, says Erasmus, because faith can never be based on reason. The realm of reason is entirely separate from the realm of faith, which is based on a form of folly, a form of love, a form of blind love. So now this, you notice, rejects the idea that, uh, you know, or rather separates reason and religion. Uh, reason and revelation become two separate things. And faith is no longer, according to Erasmus, based on reason, but based on something different, something blind, something, a form of love. So now by rejecting the mixing of critical rationalism with with Christian theology, um, which was which we can also find arguably in St. Thomas Aquinas or, uh, or, or other philosophers, um, this distinction uh, leads in turn to widening um, intellectual trends, one of which uh, emerges later, as you'll see, as the scientific revolution. But with respect to religion, Erasmus is advocating a return to simple, heartfelt beliefs um, with an individual's forming a personal relationship with God rather than a relationship mediated through a priest or through the church. It is a relationship based on simplicity, a, a relationship based on naivety, on humility. And that, he said, was um, were the true, uh, you know, represented the true spirit of the scriptures. And that is really what represented the key to a happy life. So now the printing revolution I have already mentioned it once, but let me talk about it in a little more detail. The printing revolution now gallops ahead. In the 1300s, Europeans learned how to make paper from wood pulp, and they learned it from the Arabs, uh, who in turn, of course, learned it from the Chinese. Um, engravers were already experimenting with printing books uh, from wood blocks. You see, they would create these wooden blocks and they would you know, write the, um, the, uh, carve out the letters on a wooden block, and then they would print the page in one particular go, ink it and then press it on paper or, or anything else. Uh, and that would be woodblock printing. But now, uh, the way in which printing began to transform is that by the 1400s, um, people began to invent, and Gutenberg in particular perfected the idea of movable type. Movable type meant that you didn't create an entire block that you printed, but rather that you created little, little alphabets. And you place those alphabets in a, uh, you know, in a strip and place that strip in a block or then you print it on paper. Now, in the beginning, this had to go through many, many permutations before it could be perfected. But once it was perfected, it, it made uh, it possible for printers now to publish books in the thousands. It made it possible to, to have print runs in the thousands, books that were very um, precious and difficult to recreate because they had to be rewritten by hand could now be published and printed in the thousands and be made available in the thousands. So by 1455 Gutenberg built the printing press. The first thing he did was he began to print the Bible. He then began to print the Bible not just in Latin but in other languages and as things went on the, the press, the, this particular Gutenberg press was then used by um, protesting Christians to publish their literature which led to the Protestant Revolution, uh, Reformation etc and it was also used to publish works about science and so many other things. In other words it led to an entire revolution. It led to the rapid dissemination of new ideas and really it is at the heart of how Europeans transformed themselves through printing. They were churning out books, they were, you know, by, by the thousands and they were reading them by the thousands. A sort of fever gripped Europe in this period to print as many books as possible and to read them. And any book that was banned was more likely to be read because, you know, uh, the fact that the book was banned generated interest in that particular book. At the same time, the Ottoman Empire uh, was not interested in the creation of the printing press. It did, they didn't want to import the printing press from Europe either. In fact, they banned the publication of the Quran or Hadith, etc., which they considered to be the only important things to publish via the printing press. They considered that uh, the Quran could only be um, written by hand by somebody who had properly done the wuzu, you know, had uh, performed abolition so that they were clean. And so they didn't want the Quran to be published in this particular way. For 300 years, in fact, the Ottoman Empire kept the printing revolution at bay. And naturally, 
um, that cost the Ottoman Empire in terms of uh, you know um, being able to furnish the population with the uh, books and literature and ideas that would have stimulated um, uh, you know uh, stimulated thought and uh, caused people to think about the world in a new way so really it was an enormous loss to uh, Ottoman civilization as, and to Muslim civilization as a whole Last but not least, I want to speak uh, about a great thinker, Niccolo Machiavelli, who lived 1469 to 1527. He's an Italian historian, politician, diplomat, philosopher, humanist. Uh, he was a writer based in Florence during the Renaissance. And he really is a prototype of a modern empirical, empiricist scientist. He, he really can be credited with having formed or founded modern political science, especially um, political ethics because what he did the great service he performed is that he emancipated the study of politics from theology and moral philosophy he wasn't interested anymore in studying what was right and what was wrong he was interested now he changed the focus from studying what was right and wrong what was ethical or unethical what was Christian and unchristian he changed the focus to what is it that works in politics? How does politics actually, how is the game of politics actually played? So for this purpose, he wrote a very famous book. In fact, he didn't title it uh, at that time. It was uh, in the form of a long letter uh, to the Medici uh, family um, and to the head of the Medici family. It, is, it was subsequently titled The Prince. It's witty, it's cynical, and it's set aside, as I've already said, Christian morality and gave the ruler ruthless practical advice on how to run a government, how to run a state. Machiavelli's central idea is virtue. Virtue not in the sense of what is right or wrong, but virtue in the sense of power. Of, of, of virulence, the Latin word of being virile, power and virtue is really the same. So virtue here by, is really meant how to be virile, how to manage power. And in this you can say that he created um, a school of thought which we refer to today in IR as well as in political science as realism. Rulers, he said, cannot be bound by morality. The ends have to and do justify the means. Um, but this was true only for the prince, not for the general population. There was a dual morality that he introduced, the idea of dual morality. What common people should observe one kind of morality, but the prince who was in charge of running a government, running a society, had to look at things very, very differently. Uh, the prince cannot observe all those things which are considered good in men, wrote Machiavelli. The prince has to uh, do things in order to safeguard the lives and properties of people that ordinary people don't have to do. Um, so, in a very famous passage, Machiavelli writes, uh, uh, it is... Uh, of course, always better to be, I'm paraphrasing here, it is always better to be loved and feared, but if one has to choose between being loved and being feared, it is better to be feared than to be loved. Why did Machiavelli say this? He said this, this is his most famous uh, sort of passage, and he said this be not because he wanted people to be feared, but he said this because he understood that love is reciprocal, but fear is something the state can control, the prince can control. So the uh, church at the time immediately placed Machiavelli's great work on the list of prohibited works and considered that this was a very unethical idea, a very unchristian book, that he was the teacher of evil and you know he got a really bad press. And even today in the English language we often refer to a certain idea or a certain person as being Machiavellian. Uh, he is very Machiavellian in his approach to politics. But really what Machiavelli was talking about was understanding politics not as we wish it were, uh, as we wish it were, but understanding politics as it really is. So with uh, Machiavelli, I'll sort of close my lecture for today on the Renaissance. Uh, let's just recap what I have uh, spoken about. The Renaissance was first and foremost an art movement, a movement that really meant, made itself felt through the arts and through architecture and through changing the way in which all of that was approached. But it was, although represented through the art, it had a deeper philosophical foundation and that foundation was that it wanted uh, uh, thinkers, scholars and the ordinary people even to turn their attention away from the divine and to place 
human beings at the center of their scholarly endeavors of their understanding of the world. And um, last but certainly not least, the Renaissance was about individual creativity, about mastering all that one could master. Nothing which was human was considered to be beyond the Renaissance person. Who, nothing that could be known to other people could be unknown to us. It was a period of enormous vitality and creativity and therefore we consider the Renaissance to be the period in which medieval Europe uh, you know, begins its transformation uh, into uh, the period of modernity. I hope you enjoyed that lecture. And I hope not, I also answered for you that, uh, the question of whether or not art can transform the world. The entire uh, rise of modernity owes itself to Renaissance art. Thank you so much.